Well, we're a few minutes early, but I think we'll go ahead and get started. The topic of our Sunday School lesson, you may have not heard anything taught on this at, at any time in your life, I don't know. We're going to talk about the subject of fools. Fools. When I was uh, attending Bob Jones University, I took a, a course in the, the Shakespearean plays. And I believe this is a quote from one of the Shakespearean plays. It has to do with the scene of a court with a king or authority and a court jester. And they had someone in the stocks, locked up in the stocks. The court jester comes in. He looks at this guy that's in the stocks. He says, what cruel garters you're wearing. Of course, not everybody here might know what a garter is. <laughs> I think it holds up women's hose or garments or whatever. So he says, what cruel garters you're wearing. So the guy in the uh, stock says, where did you learn that, fool? Because he's a jester, called him a fool. The jester turns and says, not in the stocks, fool. <laughs> well, the word fool is used in the Bible. There are cautions against the use of the word, how it is used, in what situation it is used. There are actually five different Hebrew words for the word that we translate fool. Four of those kinds of fools are to be found in the book of Proverbs. Now, the first one we're going to briefly describe is what we might call the simple fool. And in Proverbs 14:15, uh, we read the naive, that would be the simple fool, believes everything, but the prudent man considers his steps. So here we have the characteristic of naivety, believing most anything you might tell him. He's considered to be foolish because of that. But there's another characteristic of that same fool, and it has to do with the fact that he is not persuaded or committed to anything. The problem with that is if this person who is not committed to anything, according to the book of Proverbs, meets somebody who is committed to doing evil, they're easily persuaded to be committed to the doing of evil. Of course, there's a lesson to be learned, and it's simple but profound. Unless you're fully committed to always comply with the revealed will of God, you are in great danger of falling for anything. Falling for error, falling for evil. This fool is not only in danger of being tempted, he himself is easily a source of temptation to others because when a person is easily deceived themselves, then they be can become a tool in the hands of evil, sin, even of Satan, to be a deception to others. Well, there are three things this fool needs, and they're good qualities for everyone, and that is he needs understanding, he needs maturity, he needs wisdom. 
Now that's the simple fool. Proverbs also describes for us another fool. This person is dull and thick-headed. <coughs> dull and thick-headed. He is obstinate. He is closed-minded. And he is a scorner. All of these things characterize this particular fool. Thick-headed, closed-minded, those two things are very closely related. So we'll consider them together. Turn with me to Proverbs 21, 20. We're looking at even more characteristics of this fool. Proverbs 21 20, there is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man swallows it up. Uh, King James translates it, spendeth it up. He is what we would call a spendthrift. A person who spends his money extravagantly and are unwisely. That's foolish to do that. It's characteristic of this fool. He does not know how to save. He never has anything in reserve. He is bent on spending every penny of his paycheck. We used to say his money burns a hole in his pocket. He can't wait to spend it on something. In fact, the problem is many times because, of course, credit cards were not available to fools in the days of Proverbs, but in our day, you can spend more than your paycheck because of credit and credit cards. And we live in a generation of compulsive buyers. Uh, years ago, we had opportunity to listen to some tapes on the subject of finances by a man by the name of Larry Burkett. He was a Christian man. He's now with the Lord. But he had some excellent material on the subject of finances. And this was years ago, and according to his knowledge of the situation, he said then the average American spent in a year $1,500 more than they made. I would suspect that's a very conservative estimate, especially in our day. There's a saying, perhaps you are aware of it, heard it, a fool in his money is soon parted. That's an old saying. Now that's a mark of a fool. So turn with me, if you will, now to Proverbs 1 and verse 32. Proverbs 1 and verse 32. For the waywardness of the naive shall kill them, and the complacency of fools shall destroy them. Another characteristic of the foolish is being complacent. What does complacent mean? Well, I here would say that it describes the condition of, of just taking it easy. Just taking it easy. Such a person is not aggressive, not industrious, just laid back. He's happy with just enough to get by on. And um, he will end up uh, being very foolish and not prepared. Um, 
You know, let me just insert here some practical advice. I think this could go out very well to parents. One of the worst things you can do in raising your children is to give them everything they want. Uh, you can give them what they need, you can give them some favors over and above that, but to always indulge them for this, that, something else, every little thing they want. Oh yes, you, you know, provide it for them. No. Parents have a moral and biblical duty to provide the basics. The basic needs of their children, but they also equally have the duty not, not to enforce the wrong basic life attitudes which already exist in the child. You see, that child is already born with a sinful nature, with weaknesses, um, selfishness, pride. Pride is one of the areas that needs to be dealt with. If you can feed that by your lack of discipline, by your indulging them, and what you're doing is one of the worst things you can do to that child. You're strengthening the sin nature rather than curtailing it, disciplining it, and dealing with it. You see, these two things go together very I think clearly, it's very difficult for a person to have everything he wants without at the same time being very prideful. See how easy they go together? I, I have all of these things. These are my things. And you can easily very be proud of those things in a wrong way. Take pride in them. It's the abundance of material things, not the lack of material things, which make the most spiritual demands upon people. And that's true of children. It's true of adults. When children grow up having everything handed to them, it is easy for them to develop the habit, the habit of spending rather than saving. Easy come, easy go. And that develops very quickly. Their attitude becomes, why not spend what I have? Because there's more coming where this came from. And they're learning wrong, very damaging uh, attitudes in life very foolish. We want our children to be generous, but we do not want them to be wasteful or extravagant. The second mark of the kind of fool that we are considering is that he has a flippant, flippant attitude. And this is seen Sadly, in regard to his sinful ways. Turn with me to Proverbs 14, 9. Proverbs 14 and verse 9. Fools mock at sin. If you've lived long enough and worked in the world and, and the un converted among the unconverted in the world situation, you realize that a lot of the jesting and the joking are dirty jokes. They're immoral jokes. They're making fun of adultery, fun of unfaithfulness, fun of all kinds of sin. Mocking, making a joke. Turn with me to Proverbs 10, 23. Doing wickedness is like sport. To who? To a fool. 
And that word sport can actually be, mean laughter. It's a big deal, it's a big joke. It's a laughing matter. And when confronted with the consequences, yeah, no big deal. Laugh it off. Uh, back in Proverbs 14, 9, where we read that fools mock at sin, the word sin there is a unique in its original meaning, the word used there. It actually could be better translated guilt. It can refer to the actual act of sin itself. It can re refer to the guilt that results from sinning. It can even go so far as to apply to the offering, sin offering, that is made in order to deal with the guilt of sin in Old Testament times. And I think it includes all three aspects. Why would I say that? What does the fool laugh at? What does he mock? Well, he mocks the actual sin itself. And what you have is a person laughing joking about that which God hates. Only a fool would do it. Sin is no laughing matter. Sin brought about the fall and the total depravity of man. A man who laughs at sin is only exhibiting and proving the extent of his own depravity. How far he is from God. Sin is the root cause of shame, suffering, misery, sorrow, and heartache. How foolish to laugh at any of those things. Or to joke about. Only a fool would find those things, quote, amusing. The wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, eternal death. You see, the act of sin and the consequences of sin are inseparably linked together. So if you're amused at and laugh at one, you automatically are amused at and laughing at the other. So if you are making a joke about the sin itself, it includes the consequences of the sin, which is eternal death. So you're making a joke of eternal death and separation from God because you can't separate those two. He not only makes light of the act of sin, he takes very lightly the guilt of sin. He makes fun of those who have some sensitive conscience. Why? Because he has long seared his own conscience. In fact, he delights to see others fall into sin. Do you know why? Because it soothes his own conscience. As long as there's somebody out there who hasn't fallen into those sins and practiced those sins, that disturbs his conscience. So he will plot and plan, if possible, to bring you into the same sin. To get rid of a source of conviction in his own life. He thinks that no longer being bothered by sin is a mark of maturity. Yeah, I'm mature. I can deal with it. He's only fooling himself.
because sooner or later it will catch up with him. I want you to think with me a, a moment about this. So here's a guy boasting of his maturity. He can play around with all kinds of immorality, all kinds of sin, because he's mature. Has no thought of dealing with his sin at all. Now think with me. One of the major causes of depression is sin. Sin that has not been biblically dealt with. So this guy is setting himself, who's so mature that he can play around with sin, he's setting himself up inwardly at some point for depression that can set in. Because even unconscious to himself, there are certain aspects of our own depraved life that brings about a sense of guilt. And that guilt has to be repressed and denied. And all of these things can work together to bring about depression. The only way that anyone can deal biblically with sin, of course, is to repent. Repent. True biblical repentance. And what's so sad in our day is that it's being taught and being preached that you can come to Christ and be saved and very little, if anything, many times is even said about repentance. It's almost an unknown concept. So what you're doing in that case is encouraging people, quote, to come to Christ without dealing with the issue of repentance. And so the guilt of sin still remains and there's no true salvation. There's only the idea that I must be okay because I followed these steps, I did this, I did that, so I must be in. But that sin has been repressed, not biblically dealt with, not confessed, no repentance. That encourages people to take sin lightly. And anyone who takes sin lightly is a fool. A fool. Now, here's a penetrating question and then we will look at some other characteristics. I just mentioned about anyone who takes sin lightly is a fool. But who's the greater fool? The person who has taken sin lightly or the, the source that is encouraging them to take sin lightly? Who's the greater fool? Could be the one standing in the pulpit if he's not preaching the true biblical gospel. This fool not only makes light of the act of sin and the guilt of sin, the results of sin, he makes, this fool makes fun of and jokes about and makes light of the remedy of sin. He makes fun of the gospel. He views this whole matter of the gospel being foolish to him. When a man begins to, well, you remember in Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the, foolish, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them. Well, the third characteristic that this fool has is that he's quarrelsome. He likes to argue. You know, that can become a defense mechanism 
to avoid the penetration of the gospel, make an argument out of it, um, disagree with it. It's a defense mechanism to keep getting to the issue. Proverbs 20, verse 3, if you will, look it up. Proverbs 20, verse 3. Proverbs 20, verse 3, keeping away from strife is an honor for a man, but, but any fool will quarrel. And uh, they'll pick anything just to get you off of their back. They might even say, oh yeah, I know, but uh, there's a lot of discrepancies in the Bible. That's a, that's a defense mechanism. They don't want to hear any more of the gospel. They're putting up that shield to deflect the penetration of the gospel. Um, let me just mention here, in connection with it being very argumentative, and I've seen this over the period of my life in ministry, many, 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 many times. There are people who enjoy stirring up strife. They want to keep strife active many times in a workplace, particularly in the family. They want petty little arguments because they like to get it started and then step back and watch the fireworks. Watch the arguments, the fighting going on. They enjoy it. It's amusing, amusing to them. They are stirring up strife on purpose. Usually, when things quiet down and nothing's going on, they'll find a way to stir up trouble. I see this in the life of the men in prison that we're working with. They'll write to me or call me, we'll be talking, and they'll say, well, this happened and my, uh, my dad did this, my mom said that, my sister got involved, and it's just a whole mountain of problems that could have been avoided, and the guy in prison is hearing this and hearing that, hearing this side of the story, nothing but strife. Nothing but strife. This um, fool is quarrelsome. One reason is because he himself has a quick temper. A quick temper. And uh, he excuses that quick temper by saying, well, that's, that, you know, that's me. I just, that's the way I am. I just, I just say what I think. I just speak my mind. As if that's a, something good. It isn't. It's always good to tell the truth. It's always good to speak up for the truth. But it's not good necessarily to speak your mind. Another characteristic of this fool is he's unreliable. Turn with me to, well, that's okay, we won't turn there. Um, the Bible says that um, it's, it's 
Having confidence in an unreliable man is like having a broken tooth or a broken foot. And we've all known what it is to deal with people who are unreliable. It's a characteristic of the fool. Another characteristic is he has a very high opinion of himself. He has a maverick mentality. He takes pride in that I'm an independent thinker. You cannot reason with him. Why? His mind is made up. His mind is closed. You can't reason with him. Now, the sixth and final characteristic is he's unteachable. Unteachable. He already knows the facts. Well, this brings us to a fourth kind of fool, and that would be the scorner. The scorner. And in the Old Testament, there are about 30 references to the man who is a scorner. Nothing good is said about him. He is described in the scriptures as having a sneering lip, a haughty expression, as being angry, wrathful, proud, insolent, arrogant, revolting. He belittles others. He delights in his scorning. He makes fun of everything that is decent, clean, wholesome, innocent. He is inflammatory. He is a source of contention. He is unteachable. These are all biblical descriptions of this person found in Proverbs. It's interesting, and the, some of the ways of dealing with him are pretty drastic. Proverbs 22 says, 22.10 says, cast him out. It'll be a benefit to others. Well, we've looked at some fools, characteristics of some fools, multiple characteristics. What about foolishness? It's part of the fall. It's part of the depravity of man. And what does the scripture say about it, dealing with it in your child? Do you know? Foolishness is bound. Where? In the heart of the child. But the rod of correction will drive it far from him. And so you spare the rod and you damage the child. You spoil the child. Um, scriptures don't say anything about having a time out. Can't find that in the scriptures. I think it was my daughter who was visiting with us recently. We were talking about the prison ministry. And she was talking about why the, she made the comment. She says, well, she said the problem with the prison ministry is that it's, it's just a time out for adults. And it doesn't always accomplish anything sometimes makes matters much worse. We are born in sin, and sin begins to find expression as soon as we are born. And those sinful expressions need to be dealt with early so that they are weakened and not strengthened. Second application. All of the various manifestations of 
foolishness can be traced to the basic sin of rebellion against the sovereignty of God. Turn with me to Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 14, 1. The fool, the fool has said, where did he say it? In his heart. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And a good literal rendering of that verse would be something like, the fool has said in his heart, no God. It's not necessarily denying the existence of God. It's more along the line of saying no to God. No, God. Not me. You're not going to run my life. No. That's to resist the sovereign rule of God. Setting oneself up as being wiser and more powerful than God. That is the height of foolishness. In essence, it is saying that I know better than you know, God. And I have the power to determine my own destiny. So get lost. What about the knowledge of God? Paul says, oh, the depth and the, of the riches of the wisdom of God. His ways are unsearchable and his judgments are unfathomable. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. Men defy God by rejecting the will of God as being revealed in His Word. You cannot live in defiance to any portion of God's Word and expect to prosper. Defiance takes the form of overt disobedience, apathy, manipulation. Men defy God by rejecting His sovereign and providential rule over them. Third application, the man who is prepared to defy God has the propensity to commit any foolish act. The man who is prepared to defy God does not fear God. A man who does not fear God has ultimately no restraint whatsoever to keep him from committing any sin. The lack of restraint is seen in the fool returning to his sin. Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Even the repulsiveness of sin does not restrain him. Here's a sober warning for believers, Christians. Due to remaining sin, the child of God, even the child of God, is capable of behaving foolishly. And we need to guard against it. Because sin is very, very deceiving. Fifth application, Ephesians 5.15 says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And nothing 
nothing could be better for you than the will of God. You can't improve on that. So don't think you can. Don't imagine that you can. Proverbs 9, 6 says, Forsake your folly or foolishness and live and proceed in the way of understanding. Well, that's our lesson on fools and foolishness. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. We confess, Lord, in our days before coming to know you, how, how very foolish, how very foolish we were. We confess, Lord, that even after being saved, we have allowed remaining sin in the world to uh, tempt us into doing foolish things. We pray that you'll forgive us and help us, Lord, to be wise, to have much wisdom in our thoughts, in our words, in our ways. You've said in your word that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And so, Lord, today we would ask for wisdom. Whether it's in the matters of our family, our church, our work, our life, our interaction with others. May we be wise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.